Welcome to Bike Life Radio from KWNK 97.7 FM, Reno Bike Project, and BikeWashow.org in Reno, Nevada. We ride our bikes out into the world with a recorder, and we talk to people about their bikes and their lives. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. Uh, today, we go on a bike date with a nurse, uh, but we find out it's not her first bike date. And... Uh, uh, we stopped by the Hub on Pine. That's a coffee shop and a bike shop all in one. And they were hosting a bike group, a World Bicycle Relief Fund that uh, gives bikes to doctors around the world. And then it was Father's Day recently. And uh, so we talked to a, uh, a, about being a dad and bikes in Mount Shasta. And we also talked to my kids about uh, me being their dad and making them ride bikes in places too. Before we get to all that, the news. In international news, there's a collaboration to 3D print bicycle frames. Yeah, Sirota Bikes is collaborating with AP Works, which was founded in 1972. They use a material called Scamali. It's a high-strength aluminum alloy for 3D printing. Speaking of manufacturing, plastics are being recycled into bikes. Uh, that's being done by a company called IGUS. Uh, the company focuses on markets in Asia and North America. They're even making ball bearings out of plastic, a recycled plastic, and they're planning to make plastic handlebars too. There's a new trend, call things bicycles that aren't bicycles at all. Heard of bicycle health? Well, that's an insurance company. Uh, it's not a bicycle company. Uh, and now there's also Bicycle Capital. It's a global asset management firm. Adding the word bicycle to businesses or to things is apparently a popular marketing move. In national bike news, we start out with something old that we just learned about. Cars do a lot more wear and tear on roads than bikes, right? We know that. So how many times would you need to ride a bike to cause the same damage as one car trip? Well, the answer is you'd have to ride a bike 17,000 times to equal the wear and tear of one single car trip. And that's according to streets.mn. Uh, that's a Minnesota bicycle advocacy group that recently reported on a 2016 report uh, by a university professor. New York City is using big data to make decisions about where to put bike lanes. Bike share in the city uh, generates a bunch of data and they can use it to know where people want to go and where bike lanes should be. Now, an anecdotal observation as I look through the news this month, there seems to be a lot more kids getting hit and killed than usual around the world and in the United States. This is likely a combination of kids being out of school and temperatures warming up. So there's more kids out on the road and people, drivers, should keep an eye out. You're listening to KWNK 97.7 FM in local bike news from Bike Life Radio and BikeWashow.org. The annual review of bike-friendly cities is out from People for Bikes. Out of a total possible score of 100, the average across the United States for cities is 27. Reno scored a 22, Las Vegas a 19, and Carson City scored a whopping 41, way above the national average. For the first time, a local event is sponsoring Bike Ballet. Food Truck Friday is sponsoring and promoting this Bike Ballet from 3 to 9 p.m. at Ida Wild Park. It's right in the middle of the uh, event at Cowan Drive. Volunteers from BikeWashow.org are checking bikes and keeping them uh, safe while people stuff their faces with rad food. So ride your bike to Food Truck Friday and skip the traffic and parking hassles. We're calling it Food Bike Friday now. The City of Reno and Regional Transportation Commission are planning to spend $20 million on a downtown micromobility network. That's right, they're planning to spend the money on more than one street. University Way, Virginia Street, Evans Street, Lake, uh, 5th, 6th, and Vine, and 3rd are all on this plan. They just wrapped up the survey and they were asking people which streets to do first. They also asked if they should spend a lot of money on really fancy bike paths or just a little money on more bike paths that are protected. Uh, we'll report the results when they come out right here on Bike Life Radio. 
The Yarrington Chamber of Commerce put bikes at center stage for the 4th of July celebration. They're having children in a marching bicycle parade on Main Street. That's it for bike news from bikewashoe.org and KWNK. A reminder that Bike Life Radio airs on the first Sunday of every month at noon, right here on KWNK 97.7 FM from the Reno Bike Project on Grove Street. Today on Bike Life Radio, we talk about Father's Day and the role of fathers in bikes. And uh, we talk to a group that is giving bikes to doctors around the world. But first, we go on a bike date. Uh, I brought my tandem on this date, and uh, I come to find out that it's not her first tandem bike date. Here's Katie Callahan. Yeah, so what am I going to do? What are you going to do? Oh, God. This is already going to be so bad. Katie Callahan. I'm a person that looks awful on photos. On on radio. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so what am I doing? Am I talking about this tandem bike? Yeah, you look at me in the eyes and you ignore (laughs) this microphone thing. Should I have to make eye contact? (laughs) Oh, Jesus. Okay. And so you ignore this thing. (laughs) Okay. It's not even here. All right. (laughs) So awkward. All right. Yeah, uh, so we're going to ride a tandem, okay. and I, I texted you yesterday, Katie Callahan, about riding this tandem, and you yeah. said, oh, I love tandems, and <laughs> like exclamation mark, and uh, why? Oh, they're just super fun. Uh, so when I was growing up, my best friend, Shane, uh, he had a tandem, but it was like an old school tandem with like the wide handlebars. He found it in his backyard. I think it must have been his parents. It was green. It was like an old Schwinn. It was super sweet. Uh, But he used to let me ride on the back of it, and we used to take it off sick jumps and crash, and I would just laugh and giggle the entire time. It was, like, the funnest thing. Also, I should add, one of the best dates I've ever been on was on a tandem. The guy was, like, a little different, a little obsessed with bikes in a way that I have never experienced. But the date in and of itself was so fun, and it was because we were on a tandem. Like, I enjoyed the tandem bike probably more than I enjoyed him, but, um, yeah, it was super fun. What what did you enjoy about the date besides the tandem? Was there anything else, or what was it about the tandem that you enjoyed about the date? Um... (laughs) Well, like I said, I didn't really enjoy him, but I enjoyed the bike. (laughs) So you went on a date with a bike. We never went on a date again after that. Um, Yeah, because he was different. But I enjoyed the bike because, okay, like I really like physical activity. I'm obsessed with physical activity. I think like anyone that gets to know me like quickly realizes like Katie's in her best when she's like doing something um she doesn't do well sitting still and so like this person showed up with a tandem just right out the door and i was like let's do this you know and he was you know that he was going to show up with it no i had no idea really no way yeah but i'm like always willing to like uh try anything so yeah he showed up with the tandem and he was like kind of talking down to me like are you going to be able to get on this tandem and I was like (laughs) I mean it's a bike bro like yeah I'm definitely gonna you don't know me I used to jump tandems yeah Yeah. I'm getting on this damn tandem you know with or without you (laughs) (laughs) you think you can handle me on this tandem yeah Yeah. you think you can handle me on this tandem yeah exactly so I was like I'm riding this tandem <laughs> oh god this is a radio show and i just said that word that's so okay sorry. that's okay we'll bleep it out <laughs> okay um so then yeah i i got on the tandem and he was like pleasantly surprised he was like wow you really know how to ride tandems i'm like well it's a bike you know it has pedals and a handle and you just go you know um but it was super fun we buzz all around town on it and people like I think the funnest part was like other people were just as excited for me as I was excited. Like they're like, oh, my God, that's so cool. A tandem. And like rooting me on. And I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> look at me. I, I can get on this yeah, thing. Yeah. Look at me. I'm on this tandem and that he thought I couldn't ride and has been telling me about the entire time. And so, yeah, it was a fun date. Uh, it was fun, too, because like. He was just fascinating like he was he's obsessed with bikes bikes is like a culture that i'm like 
uh, I've never really been a part of, but I like to ride bikes, but I wouldn't say like I'm obsessed in certain ways that other people are. Um, but I'm quickly becoming that way, I feel like. I talk about bikes now more and more. It's like my sister, she said like the other day, like people that ride bikes are a bunch of nerds. And I'm like, yeah, and I love it, you know? <laughs> it's so, it's, I think people that ride bikes are like fascinating in a lot of ways. Uh, the tandem that you rode as a kid, how old were you when you did that? Gosh, that was like a hellion, 16, 17, and 18. We used to run around and go to all the punk rock shows here in Reno. I know, I'm a local. Um, it's pretty rare and few and far between. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we were in high school and in college. And uh, we went, we, he lived off of Green Bray. And uh, there was a jump actually in the sidewalk in the front of his house. We used to always take it off of. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> how did that go? He like oh, call you up and be like, hey, you want to jump the tandem? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> Kind of, yeah. <laughs> we were always getting into trouble. Um, but it was like lighthearted trouble. It was never like anything serious. We used to do a lot of silly things. We did like dumpster diving together. We had like dumpster diving contests. <clears throat> We'd run around town, dump in, jump into dumpsters, grab whatever treasures we could find. And then at the end of the night, like figure out how much loot we had and compare. <laughs> We were silly. We did everything together. Uh, we still talk, and he's actually obsessed with bikes too. He actually, what? he uh, <laughs> works at a bike warehouse here in Reno, and uh, yeah, it's all he talks about. He actually has a track in his backyard um, that he's made for his mountain bikes. He is a silly character. Neat. Yeah. That sounds really, really fun. Did uh, did you do the dumpster diving contest on the tandem or no? I think we did actually. I want to say that. He did take out his tandem bike to do the dumpster diving. We rode that thing everywhere. Does he still have it? He might. It would be wouldn't be surprising to me if he did, because he's um, his parents don't like to get rid of anything, and so it wouldn't surprise me like if his parents either have it or if maybe he still has it. Yeah. So is that your favorite bike story? One of the things we do on Bike Life Radio, KWNK 97.7 FM, is we talk about uh, bike stories. And so do you think that's your favorite bike story or do you have a favorite bike story? No, my favorite bike story is definitely the date one. Um, On a tandem. Yeah, because that guy was just like so fascinating. He was just ridiculously silly and obsessed with bikes in a way that I've never experienced. Like he was looking for a girlfriend that essentially was just as obsessed as he was. And I was wondering if that was ever even possible. (laughs) Um, Like he wore a bike hat and he wore a bike shirt and a bike shorts to the date. Um, (laughs) He was literally obsessed in a way that I've never experienced. Um, (laughs) And he wanted a girlfriend that was just as obsessed and wasn't willing to settle for anything less. And, and in a lot of ways, I thought it was really fascinating <laughs> and endearing. Um, so endearing that we never went on a date ever again. But <laughs> yeah, so that was definitely my favorite. That was my favorite biking experience as far as that goes. But Shane and his uh, tandem bike was definitely an experience for me. It was a good memory. Well, is there anything else you want to say about tandems? No, I think I'm good. Thanks. Your bike life. <laughs> How was the interview? Is it okay? Yeah, it was great. It was yeah. super fun. It wasn't as scary as you thought it would be or weird? Well, I just didn't make eye contact the entire time. So <laughs> I felt like it, it made it better. Yeah, it took the pressure off by not making eye contact. Uh, okay, that, that's under, I understand now. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're going to go on a ride now. All right, right? let me repark my bike. While Katie and I were on our bike date, we came across World Bicycle Relief Fund that was doing an event over at The Hub on Pine Street. That's a coffee shop and bike shop on Pine Street in downtown Reno. This was interesting to Katie because she works in the medical industry. So you're going to hear from her in this next interview, too, from World Bicycle Relief Fund. Sonia Johnson from SRAM. Oh, all right, Uh, and... Today is World Bicycle Relief's major global fundraising effort called Pedal to Empower. Uh, we fundraise throughout the year, but this is a, uh, the one day of the year that we really focus on raising awareness for World Bicycle Relief and the programs that we run, uh, most importantly, that are empowering women and young girls in 
the countries that we act, uh, activate in, in sub sahara Africa, South America, and a few others. Excellent. Hold on a second. Hey, Katie. Katie. Sonia. Sonia, this is Katie. Hi, Katie. Uh, Tell, can you tell Katie about the, the role of bicycles and women in, uh, in, in other countries? I think she might find it interesting. Well, so uh, one of the programs we've focused on is uh, girls in getting to school. So uh, we've all heard, you know, it's five miles each way back and forth to school every day. A lot of the young women and girls in Africa have a lot of household duties, a lot of chores, taking care of their younger siblings and things like that. And so sometimes they don't have the time to get back and forth to school and get all their work done at home. So by supplying them with a bicycle, they obviously get to school much faster and they get home sooner and they allow them more time in their day. Uh, it improves their at attendance at school by almost 30%. And obviously you go to school more frequently, your grades are better, it sets you up for success as you become an adult and go into the workplace. And you've provided more than one bike to, to uh, young women, haven't you? How many? Our goal, by 2025 is to reach 1 million bikes. We are up over about 700,000 or so at this point. I don't know the exact tally, but um, every day counts, and we're hoping to reach that goal by 2025 of 1 million bicycles. That's a lot. How many have you done so far? Me personally? Not just you, but the whole organization. Uh, again, it's about, it's up over 700,000 so far. It's about a uh, little over 15 years that we've been in operation, and the numbers just keep escalating. So I think that school part is really interesting and, and, and fantastic. Also, what I've heard is that um, it's a, there's a, also a safety element as mm -hmm. well, right? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Very much. You know, uh, there's still some danger to walking to school, uh, harassment and things like that. So if the girls can get on a bicycle, they can go a little faster. And, and again, they travel together, which is a lot more safe as well. So that is a big thing to make sure they can get to and from school safely. And that's hmm. that that bicycle really empowers them to do that. Neat. Yeah, yeah my, my daughter was walking home from school yesterday and a bunch of young men drove by in a truck and they yelled at her and she didn't know what was going on. She uh, uh, asked me what what does that mean and what what is happening you know and I didn't really know what to explain or what to say to her um, but uh, yeah that's real and if she were on a bike she might be less likely to be yelled at I mm -hmm. guess are, are you based in Reno or where where is world bicycle how is world bicycle relief related to Reno uh, well so world bicycle relief is the philanthropic the um, the, the branch of SRAM. So it was started by one of SRAM's founders, FK Day. And so it's part of our SRAM company. And when you buy a SRAM product, portions of that profits goes toward World Bicycle Relief. So thank you to all your listeners. If you're riding something from SRAM, RockShox, Zip, any one of our family of brands, you're already doing a small part to support World Bicycle Relief. Our, our global headquarters are in Chicago. We're a US-based US company, but we're all over the world. We're all over the globe. And I'm here today with our Northern California uh, SRAM representative, our field guide, Matt, and this is his hometown. And we partnered with the dropout. Uh, they wanted to do something special today and we're doing something special so it seemed like a great place to be I you know I've been here for three or four days and I I just told someone I am so impressed I I haven't really ever spent time here um, I love the vibe you guys uh, you know you're really into the outdoors it's beautiful I suppose some days it gets a little hotter than today but I'm, I'm having a great time you know it's not just the school kids we we work with healthcare uh, organizations Ooh, you that's know. interesting to katie too she's a healthcare worker <laughs> you get dragged into this <laughs> when, uh, you, yeah. you wrote a tandem here of course you're gonna get dragged into all kinds of things healthcare workers what do they have to do with bicycles well so again going back to the, where transportation can uh, kind of be a limiting factor in healthcare. They might be riding around in their Jeep or Land Rover, but when that road ends, that's the last patient they can see. When they have a bicycle, they can see a lot more patients. I think it's something like 88% more uh, visits with the use of a, of a World Bicycle Relief Buffalo bike uh, for those those doctors and nurses and healthcare providers. And that means... Like in rural areas? In rural, rural parts of Africa, yeah. So that's more immunizations and, and greater health care and, and improving the lives of everybody. Do you want to ride a bike and give health care, Katie? 
Uh, I do ride a bike and give health care. At the same time? <laughs> really? I didn't well, know that. I ride my bike to work a lot. Yeah. And, and that's another thing. Is so, so. These bicycles, uh, we also work with organizations and uh, supply them for companies where uh, their employees can use this to commute back and forth to work. Uh, they show up on time. They uh, get a promotion. They don't lose their job. Um, so yeah, the power of bicycles. You know, if you've ever had a walk somewhere, uh, you know, it can take a long time. Maybe not the most efficient thing in the world. So uh, getting them on a bike, pedaling there, they get to where they're going faster, more frequently. All good things. Huh. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, reading about that as well, that, that physicians were able to see a lot more patients that way. And I just thought it was really interesting that uh, a doctor would ride a bike. Like, that's not something that really fits in our uh, uh, perception of, uh, like, in our culture. Right. You know? But am I wrong, Katie? Is that, you, you are a physician, and, <laughs> and, uh, and you yeah, ride a bike. Yeah, you're 100% wrong. <laughs> You know? I always just find it fascinating, like, hearing people's perceptions of, like, yeah. what a physician does or doesn't do. It's fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, we're healthcare oriented, right? So most of us are pretty active, I would like to believe. So in doing that activity, yeah, I think there's a lot of people that ride bikes. A lot of doctors that ride bikes. Yeah, yeah. or nurse practitioners or PAs. I mean, I think nurses, like, I, I think most people are pretty active in healthcare. That's an interesting thought. So maybe in, uh, I guess, third world countries or wherever it happens to be, there may be doctors who want to ride bikes and don't have them. Right, and so that's why worldwide bicycle relief uh, is, is well, right. Like I said, it's it's to uh, it's part of their work. They they ride the bike to get to villages that are further out, where again a motorized vehicle can't reach them. So they get on the bicycles, they visit other villages, see more patients. And so I guess that's another uh, cultural misnomer is that well here in the United States, a doctor can afford any kind of bike that they want. And maybe in other countries, they, they necessarily can't afford a really nice bike or have access to a really nice bike. So they've got a really dumpy bike that won't get them very far. Is that a, Am I wrong there, too? Well, I think, you know, the Buffalo Bicycle is a purpose-built bike. Uh, it's 50 pounds of steel. It can carry over 220 pounds on its rack. Uh, it's very durable. Uh, it can withstand the, the tough terrain of, of the dirt roads, the unpaved roads of, of rural Africa. And it's about access. It's not about um, ha being able to afford something. It's about having the right type of, of mode of transportation. And a Buffalo Bicycle is, is that perfect tool. So can we put a x-ray machine on the back of that or, or something, Katie? I don't know. <laughs> you can ride a buffalo bicycle. So, like, if you need a tool, like if you're going to go in and uh, help I mean, somebody. You and don't need an x-ray machine to carry for people, but I think you could definitely get around on it for sure and take what you need on it. For I'm, sure. I'm thinking about like some kind of tool that a physician might need in the, in the field that would be really heavy and you couldn't carry it walking and you'd need a car or you'd think that you'd need a car in order to get it there, but you might be able to get it there on this bike. Most of the things that a physician or a nurse practitioner uses are pretty simple, you know, a stethoscope and uh, their brain. You know, so HIV AIDS obviously is, is still something that is a big health care concern and um, immunizations for children and they've got to stay on schedule. So making sure that they can get there uh, reliably and that's what the Buffalo Bicycle from World Bicycle Leaf can do for them. What about like an ambulance type thing? Could you put a trailer on the back and then put we your patient on it? Really? Yeah, we have done that. They have been rigged up so that they can transfer transport somebody who's yeah so um, some sort of illness that they can't walk themselves they can go pick them up and tow them back with the world bicycle leaf mm. buffalo bike yeah so the doctor would have to be very very strong you're pretty strong aren't you <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> i have huge deltoids um, what do you think of the idea of working in another country and riding a bike to go help people do you, what, do you, what do you think of that as Katie? far as me goes yeah um I, uh, I think it's, I mean, it sounds really amazing, actually, like a really good opportunity. It sounds like a way of giving back. Um, it seems like a really caring and generous opportunity to care for other people that don't necessarily, you know, otherwise receive care. 
Uh, one of the things that we do on Bike Life Radio, you're listening to 97.7 FM KWNK, is we talk about uh, personal stories of uh, uh, bicycles. It, it can be anything. Do you have a, a personal story that you'd like to share? Oh, good question. Wow. Um, today, right now in Kansas, in Emporia, Kansas, there's a, a really big race going on a huge competition it's called unbound and i i rode there i i competed there in 2017 and uh i'm out on the course and you get kind of out there by yourself and you start to your mind starts to wander and drift and there were some some cows on the side of the road and uh you know it's it's open open land out there and they're kind of trotting along and I'm thinking i think they're going to cross the road pretty soon here and I could potentially get trampled if I'm not careful and so um, I decided I think I better sprint for a little while here and get past them before they do cross the road and I think uh, I made it by just a couple of seconds so it was a good decision tough <laughs> tough to pick up the pace at that point in the ride but um, yeah you know I'm like hey cows give me a minute I just need to get past here and then you can have all the, the road and all the the prairie land back just give me give me a minute here wow amazing I'm glad you're okay oh yeah <laughs> I'm good. I'm actually from Southern California and I was out riding and uh, kind of like the cow store. I saw just this big fluffy like golden retriever kind of coming my way and I'm thinking, you know, hi puppy, nice, nice dog. And uh, he all of a sudden started picking up the pace and lunged for me. But like a matrix move, he kind of at the last second did this little flip and turned away. And uh, I was really contemplating. I was going to get taken out by this this dog, and I was thinking about my soft landing in the, the grassy shoulder to my right, but I didn't. You were thinking about your own matrix move. Yes, exactly. I was I was thinking about how I was going to dive off my bicycle. But funny <laughs> thing, later I you know, this was again during a, an event, and we were all sitting around afterward at the finish line having some food and some beverages, and somebody's like, "Yeah, this giant dog took me out and tackled me," and I was like, "Oh wow, I got lucky there." <laughs> I'm Sonia Johnson from SRAM. All right, and here with World Bicycle Relief, right? Yes, yep, with World Bicycle Relief, pedal to empower. Check us out. You're listening to KWNK 97.7 FM, Bike Life Radio. And that wrapped up our, our bike date on a tandem and our interview with the World Bicycle Relief Fund. Our next interview is about Father's Day and the role of fathers and bikes. We talked to a dad about his bike life with his kids, and we did it in Mount Shasta. You're listening to Bike Life Radio, KWNK 97.7 FM, and uh, we're talking to who? Isaiah. Isaiah. And where the hell are we? Uh, Mount Shasta, California. Why? Uh, they got bike trails up here. They got bikes. <laughs> yeah, I love the bike, and it's growing. It's growing every year. Uh -huh. Oh, it is. Yeah. So you've been here more than just this time. Yeah, I grew up here. Uh, now I live in what? South Shore. You grew up in, in Shasta. Yep, I grew up here. All right. And so what was it like when uh, when you were growing up here? I uh, take your bike out on a dirt road and ride on the dirt road for a while. And, and did that suck or what? That's all you knew. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> compared it didn't to, suck. It was compared, okay. Compared, <laughs> compared to now, I'd never do it. That sucks. <laughs> uh, and uh, now what's it like? Uh, now they've put a lot of effort into building great trails. They've been doing it for 10 years and building more and more of them, expanding. Lots of, uh, they got some grants. they got some stuff. I still have family here in the area, so I keep up with all the new trails they're building every year. So what's your favorite? I can't tell you that one. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> got to come ride it and find out. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, so... Where do you go to find your trails, and uh, you know, what's a, give some advice to people who might be thinking about coming to Shasta? Yeah, so um, Shasta East Park is where they all kind of, a lot of them end up at. So that's the bottom of a lot of the trails, and then they come off of a couple of highways further to go up the mountain. So you can ride up those trails from Shasta East Park all the way up, um, or there's some options to shuttle um, around some of the roads, so the Forest Service roads, and then get, drop in and do those as well. You going out with your whole family? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we've been doing it for years, and uh, they love coming here. Back to some of the favorite trails, is especially early season, uh, before it gets too dusty, is coming up here and try to get them. So we heard it melted out finally, so we're up here. And yeah. what happened today? Uh, just a little bike maintenance. We're here in the shop, just getting it walked right in, and he said, hey, got this little issue, can you help me out? And he said, sure, no problems. Stopped, stopped working on another bike to fix this one quick so we can go back and do some more laps. And so you're from South Shore, you said? Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what would you say it's like there in South Shore? The the riding is 
Um, a lot of rocky granite, um, kind of droppy, rough um, trails. Um, there's some. There's not really any flow trails, which a lot of the ones here in Mount Shasta are pretty good flow now. All the new trails, a lot of flow to them, smooth. It's kind of volcanic dirt, so it's good when it's wet, and then later in the summer it gets pretty dusty, but but uh, not sandy like Tahoe. So right now is a pretty good time. Great time, yeah, yeah, great time. And then we become later in the summer, we come back up and do it, and it's still good. It's just you, you, you want to be first in the line of people, otherwise you're going to get dusted out. Um, growing up here, kind of know them, and then there's a lot of like network. They interloop a lot of uh, looping trails, so one will tie into another one. You're like, oh, I wonder where this one goes. You try to ride that one and hit them. So it's not just a, they're not point to point. There are a lot of intersecting of trails. So you can do a lot of like clover leaf type stuff, add to one, go to another one, do things like that. So one of the, you're listening to KWNK 97.7 FM Bike Life Radio. One of the things that we do on Bike Life Radio is we talk about bike stories. So do you have a, a story that you like to tell? Uh, I don't have a story. I'm sure my kids have plenty of stories to tell me about being a bad dad. <laughs> stories, taking them on too far, big of an excursion. Really bikes? Oh, 100%. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, hey, 3,000 foot climb for a net, for a terrible downhill that they were like miserable at. Uh, yeah, there's a, we have plenty of bike stories all over the place, but most of them all end up being great stories. And, you know, we spend the summers. I'm, I'm a school teacher, so I get summers off. And go biking with the kids all summer, road trip, everywhere, Canada, here. Oak Ridge is one of our favorite places to go. Um, and Tahoe, Idaho. So travel all stuff. So we kind of bike all summer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so is there a, uh, a story like that that you're thinking of where you did a 3,000-foot climb with your kids <laughs> when they were like five or something? <laughs> I forget them. Type 2 fun, man. I forget those, right? It's always a good time, but they're, they're probably scarred. <laughs> but, uh, no, there was one down in Mammoth we did. Uh, I don't remember where it was called. We drove up some pass, and there's some trail I'd found. That I thought, oh, yeah, I want to try out this trail. Ends up, you get out of the car. There's just swarms of mosquitoes everywhere. And I was like, all right, guys, don't worry about it. We'll just, like, we'll ride, and we'll get away from the mosquitoes. Ends up, it was about a 500 vertical foot hike a bike to get to the trail from there. We just got eaten alive. <laughs> and, and you get up on top, and it's this great, amazing trail for about 500 feet of descent, and then it turns into this sandy mess for another like 2,000 vert down of just, you were surfing on sand the whole way down, and we just looked at each other and we're like, that was not what we thought it was yeah. going to be. <laughs> they looked at me and were like, never again. Yeah. <laughs> so but you've got them to continue riding. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, you know, you know, stoke the love for sure and, you know, get them doing it and it's, it's a lifetime of joy out of it. So that's the whole point of, I think, of, you know, hey, I'm here on Father's Day. We're here. I'm spreading the love to my kids and hopefully they do it the rest of their lives too. I'm sure they will. They're, they outride me now. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> my son now who, dude, he's fearless, will go big, go huge off stuff. I remember him up in Tahoe on uh, Armstrong Connector. It's pretty gnarly. He was, oh, God, he was five or seven years old and he took his little I think it was like a nine speed mountain bike sent it off the end of a of a switchback and never made the switchback and somehow he got back on his bike and kept going so and now he still loves it so there's there's hope for her for sure yeah yeah. so that's what you would recommend is uh maybe something a little easier I guess or simple yeah it's a it's a balance right because you want them to have that joy and that fun part of it you don't want to be bored with it you want them to push themselves it's just finding where their levels are at and that's a moving target because every year they're different and changing and i have three kids so all three of them are different levels and so you know my wife and i sometimes divide and conquer and you know, i'll she'll she'll take a kid i'll take a kid we'll do some different stuff and yeah just uh keep keep it fun though keep that's the thing we've kind of for better for worse um We've done a lot more shuttle riding than we used to just because the kids, they don't like grinding away for an hour or two in the heat. <laughs> don't blame them. Hill, yeah. yeah, don't blame them. So we do a lot more shuttle work and and uh, we're like, okay, hey, we're done. Now we'll go for a ride. Or do you we'll think just we're something. spoiling them? Oh, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> the trails they have and then shuttling on top of it. Yeah, but you know what? You build the stoke first and then, yeah. then they'll go earn it. You know, and yeah, yeah. Keep, them, keep them away from the e-bike. <laughs> Yeah, good idea. All right, thanks, Isaiah. Hey, great. I really appreciate it, and yeah, good luck out there. <laughs> thanks, man. Yeah, happy Father's Day. Hey, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we're back with uh, with Isaiah. Uh, you're out back on Bike Life Radio, KWNK, and we're not done yet because uh, we started talking about the history of the town a little bit and how it's changed. Uh, and so, it, it it used to be what? Well, it used to be a you know a mill town, a lumber town. Uh, 
we used to, there were three things here. There was uh, people in the woods, there were people on the railroad, and then there was the Forest Service. Those were kind of the three jobs that you had here. And then in 1985, uh, some local people built a ski area, now she has a ski park. And recreation, I mean, there was an old ski area on the, what we call the ski bowl back in the day, and there were tons of recreational people, lots of rafting, kayaking, stuff like that on the rivers. Um, but <clears throat> the, those weren't really employed, those weren't really jobs. Um, and so that really changed, the mills closed down, all of a sudden there was no more log trucks going through town, the mill closed, and uh, they had to try to change a little bit. And so was, they always had skiing in the wintertime, and then really turned to, you know, the rivers. You know, we got the Sacramento, we got, we're close to the Cal Salmon, the, the Rogue, the Klamath, so lots of rafters kind of moved to town. So it was kind of a more, turned into a rafting town in the summer. And mountain biking, there were a few mountain bikers doing stuff, and they were kind of, uh, that was about it. And then really, I think as the economy, you know, people locally, more riders started showing up and saying, hey, we need to start really looking at this as a boost to the economy, is mountain biking can do that. And that's something we saw, we went to Canada, five, six years ago, and we said, Canada, they're, I always think of Canada and these ski towns, they're ski towns, but in the summertime, they're mountain bike towns, and they really, they, they really embrace that, and they employ crews to run the, to build these trails and maintain the trails up in Canada, and we were like, man, it'd be amazing if this happened in the U.S., no one's doing this, and I think Mount Shasta kind of saw that and said, hey, this, that's the next step, is we're a ski town in the winter, we're a, we can be a mountain bike town in the summer, so there's lots of grants now, and they're building lots of new trails. And they're, you know, the, he, he was just telling me they got three crews out here working, building new trails. So there's building the economy. Plus, well, I was just sitting here listening to the bar. All these people are here, none of them are from here. They're all from out of town. Some of them are biking, but there's lots. So it's getting busier and busier with bikes, and so it's becoming a bike town. How how would you say that that changes the feel of the town itself or the people here? Oh yeah, I think it, for me it's great. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe talk to some of the older locals. Maybe they don't know. They don't get it as much. But uh, it's more like-minded people for sure. Everyone's coming here for skiing in the winter, biking in the summer, and there's still the rafting companies and the kayakers and all that. So, you know, it's I think it's what we're seeing anywhere with these recreation towns. It's you know obviously for locals, it's driving up housing prices and rents and stuff like that. So we have this, those issues we have in every one of these towns. But I think it's. Is it, hey, we're sitting, this used to be what's called the Vets Club, which was, this, you know, that old, old timers bar where all the railroaders would come in here and sit. Now you're sitting here with a bunch of bikes and bikers are all in here. So <laughs> you liven it up. It's no, no, no more pool tables and dark rooms, it's big and open. So yeah, uh, it's, it's great. There aren't people smoking in here and doing whatever. Yeah, no, you would be a pretty shady, seedy place. I wouldn't go in here now. <laughs> now it's a pretty fun place to be in. Do you remember that when you were a kid then? That that's oh, yeah. what this spot was like? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Up we're in the Deadwood Bar. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and bike shop. Yeah, so now we're in the Deadwood Bike Shop, and it's great, and it's open, big old doors, open, you know, people just wandering in, coming in. It's not closed off with the locals hanging out at the bar, you know? So as a kid, you would walk by, though, and, and see it and think it was seedy. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'd, you know, and it was probably the same, you know, five, ten people in here. I don't know. <laughs> you know, had their, probably had their mugs on the wall. <laughs> yeah. So that's a big change. You've seen a change since uh, since the 80s or the 70s or whatever, right? Yeah, really the 80s. Um, you know, grew up here skiing and uh, grew up at the ski area and skiing all the time. And that's that's been a passion and love I've had my whole life and just doing mountain stuff. How do you think that the... Uh, mountain biking and all this recreation causes housing prices to go up why is that well it's just a really great place to be i mean the mountains attractive but you have more recreational opportunities people are going to be drawn to that and attracted to that and especially if they're you know not needing to work um, and they're going to looking for places to play and so you know you're seeing you know i live in sally talk we see the same thing influence from the bay area money from the bay area coming up as a as they don't need to work as much or can work more remotely, they're looking for locations to live that are ideal. And so Mount Shasta's been a sleepy town for a long time, but it's definitely been discovered and found, and, and it's not that far from the Bay Area, so a lot of people come. All right, thanks, Isaiah. Yeah, you're wet. All right, uh, I think your bike might be close to done. <laughs> As a dad, I got my kids to ride bikes too all the time, and so we sat at the dinner table and had a heart-to-heart -heart about their experience for the first time riding mountain bikes. Here they are. Here's Alara and Ava Plaskon. 
And uh, yeah, I got my daughters to sit down with me uh, because I gave them food. Normally they're out running around or want to do something else other than talk to dad. But I got them to sit down and talk to me by bribing them with food. And now uh, they have gone mountain biking for the first time in Quincy. And last week we had an interview about mountain biking in Quincy on Mount Huff. Uh, and it was all just how awesome it is. But we want to hear for from uh, some new mountain bikers who did mountain biking for the first time on this trail and what it was like. Alara and Ava both did it for the first time, mountain biking. So we're going to interview them about what it was like. Uh, Alara Plascon, my daughter, my 16-year-old daughter. Uh, what you know? Tell me what it was like when you first started out. Um, it was it was like fun. At, well, actually, um, it was. Uh, I had this other bike, um, and I didn't really want to ride it. And I think Dad kind of knew, so he let me ride his bike. And it was a little hard to get on at first. And then I started having a lot of fun and going like super fast and I was like way ahead of them and everything. And then at some point I didn't really know like like how to like hold myself up out of the seat while going downhill because that's not something I've been really taught for mountain biking. So I was kind of forward. So what happened was this like tree uh, root was in the ground and it was stuck up in the um, trail and it kind of had like a little, it was kind of like a little ledge and I didn't really see it and I was like, oh, I'll be fine. And I like fly over my handlebars once I, when I hit it and like straight into a tree and like I had my helmet on, but like I hit the tree head first with my helmet and like it felt like I got a concussion, but I didn't. So I was, it was fine. And then the second time uh, we were going down this area and I thought I had to go fast because there were people behind me. And these ro- there were these big fat rocks and I was just going down them so quickly and I like flew straight off my handlebars again and into the rocks and got like a ton of gashes and bruises. And the third time wasn't that bad. I, um, I was on it was on an embankment, I think or yeah, an embankment. and um, my bike skid on these rocks. <laughs> on these tiny rocks and I like fell downhill into these like branches and then the bike was on top of me and I couldn't get up for a bit but then I got up and it, was, it wasn't it was that bad but um it was just definitely not something I want to do again because it was really scary and I like feared for my life in those moments <laughs> and so it's definitely not for me so yeah at first you liked it though you were yeah. when you were we should just been more careful huh Mm-hmm. <laughs> when we came down in that first accident and uh, Ava and I were riding behind you and we came up and you were laying in like a big pile of ashes because it was a big burn area and you were laying in this pile of ashes with the bike on top of you and you had a big smile on your face and then the second time that you crashed you like were smiling and then like crying and then smiling and then crying like you didn't know what to think did you? No, I, I think I was just like, I think I was in shock. Like for a minute, I was like laughing because I thought it was funny. And then like, I started to like, I was like, oh, crap. Like, oh, oh my gosh, I, I could have totally like broken something, you know? So then I started crying and I was like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. So I started laughing and I cried again. <laughs> it was kind of funny. <laughs> All right. And now Ava, you had a completely different experience the first time you rode down Mount Huff, didn't you? Yeah. What was it? What was it like? Mm. To, like when you first felt the bicycle underneath you as you rolled down the mountain. I was really scared, honestly. Really? Yeah. So that was very different. Alara was like super excited when she first started. Was like, "Whoa, this is fun!" And you were like, "Whoa, this is scary." Yeah, it was. I was really, really scared. But um, when Alara crashed, and then I was like, "Oh." I don't know what I felt. I just, the night you like kept up when you guys were behind me and I was talking to myself, I was like, <clears throat> I was like, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. So then I had like a lot of more fun. I realized what I could do on the mountain bike and stuff and how fast I can go. And it was just really, really fun for me. And I didn't crash once. That's yes. awesome. Yes, no, no, well, no, the I second time, crash. the second time well, she did. No, she crashed once. The, on the first ride? No, on yeah, the first, she did. No, the first yeah, ride she didn't. 
You guys don't remember. I remember her crashing. It was like we were going downhill, and all of a sudden, like, she's on the side, and we're like, did you crash? And she's like, yeah, I kind of did. I kind of ran into this tree. And I was no, like, yeah. I, I said I almost crashed, but I just stopped my bike. Mm-hmm. I did. I just stopped my bike. I didn't crash the first time. And you were, like, super fast. Like, you rode way ahead of us, and uh, and then you got to, like, a stream, huh? Yeah, I got to, like, this big like river stream thing mo and i and i was trying to i was gonna get there was like a log like a tiny little log going across it i was like okay i'm just gonna go through that because i don't think i want to go through this river but uh, but i couldn't get over it. i was like you know what whatever so i just like r- i rode through it like it was, it was uh, through the river like it was nothing and uh i just kept on going yeah, so that was pretty awesome. And then the second time we went, though, was different. Like, you yeah. had been to a soccer game, and you were all tired, and then what happened? And then we went mountain biking, yeah. at, like, in the evening. Yeah, so uh, we got we went all the way to the top of the mountain this time. And it was a little more crazier because there was a lot of more curves and just trees and stumps everywhere. So, um, Dad's asking, we keep on, like, exchanging if Dad's in the front or if Dad's in the back. But... Um, I wanted him to be in the front so I can get, gain more confidence if he, if how fast I could go. And I, and I realized he was going really fast and nothing was happening to him. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go fast. And I was like, so I was having so much fun and, and I like, I lost control and I like swerved to the side. And then I went, I like kind of like fell over the side of my handlebars, but went over them at the same time. And then there's this big tree stump right there, and I smash my face into this tree stump, and I get, and then I slide forward, and my whole side gets like scratched up, and like I, I like let out a huge scream, and I see Dad running up the hill. He's like, "You okay?" And my like my nose is bleeding, and like my whole side is all ripped up. But that was really scary. And then. A second time, I was all, we were like we were like right to the end, like we were on the last trail, and I was almost over to the river. Um, and I'm going down super fast. There's like rocks everywhere, and I kind of go I go a little slower, but I'm going fast, and I hit this big rock, and I fly over my handlebars, and my knee smashes into a rock, and. I like put my elbow down, protecting my face, and I like go over my handlebars, and I land in a bunch of rocks, and now I have like a huge bruise on my knee. <laughs> it's huge, <laughs> but yeah, but I still want to do it because it's super fun. Nice. So the lesson <laughs> is to t- kind of take it slow. Um, uh, have you guys ever been hurt so badly in your lives? Uh, I guess Ava, you haven't, right? Yeah. You think while you're thinking about it, maybe, Alara. Maybe while well, when Alara smashed my pinky into the the car door, but <laughs> I think I think the mountain biking was really. Yeah, hard. you've never got like a bloody nose and a big scratched up side and a big bashed up knee all at one time, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and what about you, Alara? Have you been ever been hurt so badly? Um, I honestly don't know. I mean, like the most hurt I've like ever been was when I crashed into that car's bumper on my bike oh when you were like a baby yeah but that like that like hurt so bad but i guess uh i guess that i yeah i guess that was the most hurt i've ever been i mean like smashing your head into a tree is not the best feeling yeah but skateboarding was worse oh yeah no that was definitely worse that was definitely a lot worse that was the most hurt i've ever been yeah Uh, yeah. so the lesson is to take it slow right so we should have probably taken it slower the whole time huh uh no no, going super fast. Well, I mean, was a good I, idea. I still, I still, uh, I still took it slow in the end. And I still crashed, but you know, <laughs> that's because you were scared out of your mind. Um, and uh, and it's okay to not like mountain biking, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. No, I think my I think the worst part, the, one of the worst parts I hated was when we were on like the edge and like there was like like you could see like the bottom and it was like really scary because you were like. You're like on the cliff edge. 10,000 feet up in the air or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. You were flying. (laughs) And Ava, you like to talk to yourself when you mountain bike ride, right? I've never heard of anything like that before. What kinds of things do you do and say (laughs) when you talk to yourself? I just make myself feel better about mountain biking. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, look, I can do this and stuff. 
Yeah, I guess so, but I just, like, I don't, it's not really talking to myself. I just, like, I scream. I'm like, whoa, over here, <laughs> over there. I'm oh. like, whoa. Yeah, oh. Some, something like that. That's cool. Yeah, like telling yourself what to do. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. Hey, I, I thought you were, like, I don't know, having a oh, conversation about Smurfs or something. Smurfs? Yeah, or, I don't know, I, doing I, I Roblox. Sometimes, sometimes I scree- scream to myself. I'll be like, I'm going to die or I'm going <laughs> to crash. Something like that. <laughs> That's pretty funny and cool. Eh. Uh. Yeah, I think it's really cool. Like, you're having a really good time, and you're not afraid to, like, verbalize it, you know, and verbalize your feelings. Yeah. I wonder if there's anybody else out there who verbalizes their feelings while they're doing stuff, like, out loud. What do, you, do you do De- that? Definitely me, yeah. I you do? Really? Yeah. Whenever, like, nobody's around, I do it, yeah. Huh. Interesting. Like having your own YouTube channel and you're like, okay, yeah, guys, let's go over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or when I'm playing like a game, that's the same yeah. thing I do. Yeah, for real. So, anything else you want to add about mountain biking? No. No? Okay. Uh, You're listening to KWNK 97.7 FM. We've been talking to my daughters, Alara and Ava Plaskon, uh, about mountain biking at Mount Huff. They went mountain biking for the first time. And Alara uh, liked it at first and then decided she never wants to do it again. And Ava enjoyed, uh, didn't like it at first and then uh, talked herself into it. And now she wants to go again. So, uh, two different, very different experiences. Oh, you have something else to add, okay. I don't wanna, I wanna go mountain biking, but with gear. Oh. I don't, I don't wanna go anymore if I don't have any oh, gear. Yeah. I need padding. Yeah, go a mountain protected. biker suggested that we get padding, or not we, cause I'm not a part of it, but you. Okay, I'll get you some padding, no, Laura. No, not me. <laughs> All right, so some uh, protective gear you want, right? Yeah, and also not to be tired when you go, huh? Yeah. Because if you're tired, then you're not as focused and you might crash more, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the big difference between the first time you went and the second time that you went, is that you were tired the second time. Lara and Ava Plaskon talking about their first time ever mountain biking. That's it for Bike Life Radio. We ride our bikes out into the world and talk to people about their bikes and their lives. Bike Life Radio is made possible by BikeWashoe.org and KWNK in Reno, Nevada, owned and operated by the nonprofit bike shop Reno Bike Project on Grove Street. I'm Kai Plaskon. Ride on.